Hello everybody and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on pro tips for scaling bioinformatics workflows to HPC. My name is Melissa Burke, I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll be your host for this webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, our team is joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, and the Wajak Noongar people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. At the Australian Biocommons, we are building digital capability for life science research with the aim of ensuring Australian researchers remain globally competitive. The Bring Your Own Data project is a key part of this vision, and it's a collaboration between many Australian organisations to bring highly accessible, available and scalable data analysis and data sharing capabilities to Australian researchers. One focus of the project is to improve the accessibility of command line bioinformatics for life scientists. To achieve this, the team is collaboratively developing pipelines um, and making them public that meet the needs of the community, and they are supporting others to develop and share their own workflows. We're also working to improve command line literacy and the accessibility of national compute facilities for bioinformatics. And that is where today's webinar comes in. So today, three members of the BYOD project are here to share their expertise and the best practices that they have been putting into action in the BYOD project so that you can do that in your own work as well. Joining us are Dr. Georgina Samaha, who's a senior bioinformatician at the Sydney Informatics Hub, Dr. Sarah Beecroft, who is a life sciences application specialist at the Poise Supercomputing Research Centre, and Dr. Matthew Downton, who's the Associate Director for Performance Optimization at NCI Australia. Welcome to the webinar, Georgie, Sarah, and Matthew. And I am now going to hand it over to Georgie to get you started. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for joining us. This afternoon, we're going to be giving you guys some insights into um, HPC facilities, how they work, and how you can get the most out of them. Um, we're going to start off with some context regarding, you know, what it's like doing bioinformatics on HPCs and in what situations um, it can be advantageous to choose to work on an HPC over maybe other computing facilities that you have access to. Um, we're going to cover some basics about HPC architecture, so what the moving parts are, what they do, um, and then we've got some tips for you on how to really get the most out of the system. So we'll cover, we're going to be covering software management, resource monitoring, resource optimization, and also how you can use things like workflow management tools um, to make your life easier. Um, we're going to also cover how you can get access to these facilities, um, where to find support, and the sorts of resources that are available for you at the national HPCs that are run by NCI and Pawsey. Um, you know, all these resources have kind of been developed and provided with the intention of making bioinformatics um, easier for you. So uh, let's get stuck in. So today we are talking specifically about workflows and pipelines. So they are pieces of software that are written as um, a series of interconnected tasks that we can use to process and analyze our data. So in bioinformatics, you might be, you know, you might use these, um, you might, you know, use workflows a lot in your own work. Um, you might find that they are very important for standardizing your more repetitive data processing tasks. So when you're doing work like genome alignment and assemblies, um, when you're doing variant calling, that sort of stuff, the, the sort of work you do before you actually start exploring your data. So just like in wet lab settings, we can share our workflows with each other to standardize our methods um, and ensure that our, our results can be reproduced by others um, because we're following the same series of steps exactly. Um, it can make our, you know, because of that, it can make our research more transparent and reliable. Um, workflows can also uh, save us a lot of time and need for manual intervention as well when it comes to those repetitive processes. Um, you know, so as you're collecting more and more different data and running different experiments, but you need to, um, you know, run them through the same processes, get them ready in the same way, um, you can do that with workflows. So workflows can be really useful in automating these tasks and allowing us to apply that same pipeline consistently um, and compare results across multiple experiments and data sets. 
so, you know, because we are all working across very different circumstances, so we all do very different work, we work with different sized data sets, different types of analyses, um, that means we need to work on very different facilities and infrastructures. Um, I personally move around a lot, uh, really depends, you know, where I work really depends on the type of work I'm doing, because in my job, I work on lots of different types of research projects. Um, but, you know, if you asked me a few years ago during my PhD, um, I basically went from no command line experience at all directly to my institution's HPC because, you know, that's what I had access to at the time. I didn't really know what I was doing there um, and I found it pretty hard because I didn't really understand what system was built to do and conversely, you know, what it's not built to do. Um, and I found myself kind of trying to brute force my way, my way through it. Um, so, you know, that, I guess what that's, I'm just trying to say there is that the most suitable infrastructure for your work is going to depend on, um, you know, your own needs. Uh, your analysis scale um, accessibility, so what facilities you have access to, what are easy for you to get, get into, um, and your project requirements. So for smaller tasks, you're, you might find your personal computers and local workstations offer more control and, and data interaction. Institutional HPCs are going to be good for routine data processing due to you know, relatively easy access um, and ample compute resources. Cloud options are going to be really good um, in providing you kind of elastic resources and might sit somewhere between personal computers and HPCs. Um, and national HPCs are going to be really useful for those large scale pro projects, um, given their extensive computational power um, and ability to perform complex analyses, although they are much harder um, for you to access. So if you're considering moving to HPC or you already work there, you know, whether that be institutional, commercial or national, um, you know, working there is really going to affect the experience of working with your data. HPCs offer increased computational power through parallel processing. So they enable us to um, uh, work faster um, and use more intensive algorithms. Um, and they also provide us with ample disk space to store very large data sets. However, you know, of course, because of the, how powerful and large they are, um, there are gonna be access restrictions in place that you typically cannot work around. So if you're considering working on national HPCs, um, you maybe need to keep in mind that they will have formal application processes and allocation policies, which means that you have to justify um, you know, the requirement for resources. And doing that requires that you understand exactly how many resources you're going to need. So transitioning to HPC is, is also definitely you know, not an easy task, especially if you are used to working somewhere quite unrestricted like um, cloud or a local cluster. Um, but you know, in order to use these facilities, um, and interact with the architecture, it's going to um, not only be harder to access, but it's going to add complexity to your code and it's going to require you to be very familiar with the architecture and the job schedulers to utilize their parallel processing capacity effectively. So really what, you know, practice and, um, and understanding of um, the expectations are really essential for, um, for doing work there. So you might find yourself in a few different situations in which you consider making that move to, to a high performance computer. Um, the first is probably the most obvious. So that is when your workflow requires more computational resources than your current system provides you with. You may need those resources um, to run more computationally intensive processes. So you're gonna need more memory, um, more disk space, more CPUs, um, or um, you might want to increase the throughput of your analysis. So that is process more samples much faster. Um, another reason that may not be so obvious if you're at maybe an earlier stage of your career is data governance options. So HPCs offer some really advanced security and compliance measures for very sensitive data. Um, and that ensures that you inhere, uh, sorry, adhere to, to regulations and, and more complicated ethics agreements that might be typical of um, very highly protected data. So that's some reasons just of why you might find yourself moving over. Um, this project here is just a little a little example of what these facilities can actually help you achieve in your research. Now, you definitely don't have to be working at this scale to see a positive impact um, on your work. We've worked with much smaller and much larger data sets um, on you know, institutional and national HPCs. This is really just an example of the kind of project that can really benefit um, from working on HPCs. So this is a project that some of my colleagues worked on um, with the Ancestry and Health Genomics Lab group at um, the University of Sydney. They do a lot of cancer genomics work and had been working on our university's HPC, um, which wasn't really able to keep up with the scale um, at which that they, they were working. So they were collecting more and more samples um, and they weren't really able 
to um, the, the institutions HPC didn't really have the processing power and storage capacity that, that they needed. So it was really slowing down their data processing time. So their data set was, was pretty massive. Um, it, was pro it was approaching about a terabyte per sample. Um, if you consider all the input data as well as the intermediate files that they were generating and, and output files as well together. So they really needed an infrastructure um, that could accommodate not just the really big files, but they also need the capacity to um, speed up their analyses and run many more samples in parallel than they were previously running. So um, this group ended up moving from our university's HPC, moving this work over to NCI's HPC called Gardi, um, and getting some help from some biomathematicians and some HPC experts to help them design some really efficient workflows that um, were that helped them reduce their time, the time it took them to process their data from um, months to just a few days. Um, and it resulted in not only just, you know, some obviously some very impressive papers from them, um, but those workflows are also public now and freely available to, um, to anyone who wishes to do that same sort of work on Gardi. So before I pass you guys over to Sarah to kind of explain the HPC architect architecture and start us off with some pro tips, um, these are just a few things that we'd like you to keep in mind regarding the unique challenges that you're going to face when you're doing bioinformatics on HPCs. Um, you know, I've made some pretty sweeping generalizations here, I guess, but I think it's pretty fair to say that a lot of the issues you're going to face doing bioinformatics is quite different to many other types of computational data processing. Um, these things are going to have a big impact on the way you structure your workflows, you manage your software dependencies, and you interact with the architecture. So please keep in mind that, you know, bioinformatics data is not only large, but it's very complex. So unlike other disciplines, our computations involve things like sequence analysis, um, uh, and we perform these kind of um, computations on files of varying sizes um, and type, like different formats. And the files we work with typically are not optimized for, for this kind of work. They're not designed for quick querying, so they become very cumbersome to work with. Um, on top of that, the algorithms that we're actually running, they're very intricate and they're often dealing with what are called NP-hard problems. So this means that, um, you know, as the data and analyses that, that we're running becomes larger and more complex, the processing time is going to increase, but that's disproportionate to the data set size. Um, additionally, the software that we rely on may not always scale efficiently. So requiring the use of, you know, that means we often need to use multiple uh, different tools to run different stages of the workflow because um, a lot of the tools that we are work with are designed to do very, very specific things. Um, and they might not yet yeah, perform very well at scale as well. So overall, um, that can make it pretty challenging to predict what kind of resources you're gonna need um, to complete a task. So, you know, it's gonna be very hard for you to know where to start sometimes. And it's also going to be, mean that you need to be a bit tricky um, and use a few different strategies to, to get a workflow running. So keeping all of that in mind, I'll pass to Sarah um, and she can start us off with the um, uh, infrastructure stuff and um, the pro tip. Thanks, Georgie. So just to get you familiar with some of the main concepts of how um, a laptop or really any computer works, there's kind of three main parts. The first is the central processing unit or CPU. So this is the part that actually does the processing and makes computers useful. So it kind of does the thinking. The random access memory or RAM, or you might also hear it just shortened to memory. Um, this is fast access storage um, that is used during processing. So it's a bit like the human working memory. So when you're thinking, oh, I've got to carry the one, divide by three, whatever. Um, and then somebody comes and asks you, oh, what do you want for dinner? and you completely forget where you're up to, that's a bit like RAM. So when you shut off the computer, that all goes. Um, and then storage is where files live persistently. So it's a bit like um, human long-term memory. So those will stick around, they're not ephemeral. Um, so HPC actually uses the same basic elements as a laptop. There's just more of them and the architecture has been adapted a bit, but it's the same central concepts. So here, for example, um, this is a, so uh, supercomputers or HPC is made up of many nodes. And so a node you can kind of think of like almost like a laptop, right? It's been, um, it's like one processing unit and there's many thousands of these potentially. So in this node, there's 128 cores set up over two CPUs, um, 256 gigs of RAM, which is shared by these two CPUs. Um, and, um, and so these are all connected together. 
Um, so this is the overarching anatomy of a supercomputer. So um, there's the compute nodes where you are doing your processing, you're doing your alignments or whatever, but there's some other um, essential components as well. Um, so for example, there are the login nodes. So this is where you as a user, you log in um, remotely using something like an SSH command. And this is where you launch your job scripts and interact with the scheduler, which we'll talk about shortly um, in more detail. But the high level overview of the scheduler is the program that handles where and when to run jobs. So because it's a shared resource, you can't just decide, oh, I wanna book out the whole thing for myself today. Um, it, the, the scheduler will um, allocate your job uh, in a queue and when um, it, your turn comes up in the queue, then your job will get run. Uh, there are also um, data mover nodes. Um, so these are specialized for upload and download of data. So if you are wanting to um, say download your sequencing data from the provider, um, you wouldn't run that on the compute node, you'd run that on the data mover node because you'll get a faster connection. And there's also high performance storage. So this is um, really handy for, basically it's like the RAM, right? So this is like the temporary read writer files. Um, which is really useful in bioinformatics because often a lot of data gets put into memory to be worked on. Um, and so often bioinformatics workflows are very RAM hungry. Uh, next. So when you are logging in, um, like I said, you use the login nodes. And so the main things you do here is you're submitting your jobs to the queue, managing your workflows, checking results. Did this thing work? Did it fail? Um, installing software. But I must stress, um, this is about 100 people are sharing the login node at any given time. So please don't run any programs on there. That's a bit of a pro tip. Um, you need to, it's a bit like being in the lab, I suppose. Um, you need to be courteous to those around you. If you're always um, using things in a way that are breaking it for other people, um, that's not ideal. And it will slow things down for you as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, but the compute nodes are where um, the heavy lifting really happens. So you can use these to perform very, very large tasks um, or to, so when I say large tasks, things that you maybe would not be able to do at all on a laptop or an institutional HPC or some other or cloud resource. Maybe this, the only place you can do it is um, somewhere with a, a really large amount of compute. Um, you can also use the, um, nature of uh, HPC to perform fast execution of your code. And Matthew will talk a bit about how one can do that. Um, you can also use it to perform many different tasks at the same time. So if you have thousands and thousands of CPUs, um, you could potentially run thousands of samples at the same time, which is um, gonna save you a lot of time. So another sort of pro tip is please delete the files when you're done with them. Um, when you're writing to Scratch or the high performance system, um, that is also a shared resource and it gets full. So um, if you delete the files when you're done, it makes things a lot easier. All right, pro tips. So software installation is a little bit different on HPC. So again, keep coming back to this idea that HPC is a shared resource. So you don't have sudo access, unfortunately, um, and users can't do system-wide installations. Um, it's a little bit like you have your own house in the street. You can install things in your own directory, so you can install things at your own house. Um, you can't do it in your neighbor's house. They might not be very happy about that, and you can't decide for the whole neighborhood, this is what we're doing. Um, only the sysadmins can do that. Um, next. So fortunately, um, the sysadmins of HPCs have thought ahead. Um, and you actually have um, software that is pre-installed that you can use, and these are called modules. Um, and so we uh, recommend using these where you can, um, partly because they're generally optimized for the system and partly because it's easiest for you if what you have uh, or if what you require is already on there. And so you can load or unload modules as you like. Um, uh, and second in recommended order of preference um, is containers. So these are totally isolated software environments, which means that they're really reproducible and they are typically very easy to deploy um, for things that are 
otherwise very tricky to install or contain, it can save you hours of, of tearing your hair out, trying to figure out where is this Perl module or what is this dependency that's missing or whatever, it can be really great. Um, Conda or Mumba. So Conda is obviously quite popular for bioinformatics. If you haven't heard of Mumba though, check it out because it is much, much faster than Conda and you can basically use them uh, interchangeably. So if you know Conda, you already know Mumba. Um, so this is another package manager software that will install things in your local environment, which is handy. Um, it can cause issues with um, creating many small files during the installation. And so sometimes that can be a bit of a problem again because of the shared resource thing. Um, so we, containers would be the preference because they don't have this many small files issue. And then finally, if you really can't do it any other way, uh, local installs are always a possibility. Um, and sometimes that's just the way that you have to do something, that's fine. Um, so you can install this in a directory that you own. So for example, a pause, it would be like software, your project ID, and then your username, and then you can install whatever it is that you need to install. Uh, yeah. um, so a note on containers. Um, so I think once you started using containers, you probably won't wanna go back. I was a bit hesitant to start using them at first, and now I just think they're the best thing ever. Um, so containers are really great because um, you avoid having to do this like Conda or pip or even apt-get installs, um, but it also handles um, clashing in multiple versions. So if you have, have something, uh, which is a problem I've run into recently, you have a particular software that only works with this version of R, that version of this other dependency, this and this, um, and all of those things only coexist together at the same time for about six months in 2018. Well, that's going to be really difficult if you try to do a system-wide install or Conda sometimes the the versions will shift a little bit, but with the container, it means that you can pull down all of these versions of things that you want and lock them in place. And then it's stuck like that forever. It's not gonna change. Uh, there's not gonna be an R update and then everything's broken. So that's really useful. Um, and because of that, it's really handy for shipping software that you've published or um, environments that you'd like to share with collaborators. For example, the workflows that Georgie was talking about um, with containers, that's very easy to reproduce. They also do a great job of fitting in with um, Snake Make or Nextflow um, or even Cromwell so that you can really lock down your workflows um, and improving automation because if you pull down a container that is um, a lot easier to script up and automate than for example um, trying to share like a Conda installation or something like that. Uh, I think now on to Matthew for some more pro tips. Okay, thanks Sarah. Um, so, so I'm going to take a, a go through a couple of things and a couple of ways of looking at uh, managing a project now. So, so once you have applied for HPC facilities and your application has been accepted, you typically get quota along, uh, which has a couple of components. One is compute time, and this is often measured in things called service units, uh, which are basically just a measure of how much compute you can do. And you also get um, a storage uh, quota as well. And that's typically measured in gigabytes or terabytes. And one of the unusual things that you might have in HPC that you don't see elsewhere is that there's actually a limit on the number of file counts that you can have. Um, and there may also be some different types of storage that you have to be aware of. So typically facilities provide tools and information to help you manage your project well. And I'm gonna go through a couple of those over the next few slides. Uh, really looking at managing your compute quota, um, your storage, and then when you actually get around to submitting jobs, how do you know if your job is um, um, requesting the right amount of resources? So next slide, please. So tools to manage your quota. So quite often when you have, say, a, a, an annual project, the quota that you get gets split up into quarterly allocations. And you have to use all of that quota within a particular quarter and it can't be renewed. So it's a really lose it or use it or lose it situation. Um, and one thing that's important is that you're not the only person, you're not the only project that's in the same boat. And many projects, you know, start the quarter a little bit slowly and then ramp up their usage over time. And you don't want to get caught in an end of quarter rush um, where everybody's submitting jobs, but there's really limited resources. So. Um, can we just step forward, please? Yep. 
So at NCI and at other facilities as well, there'll be similar accounts, but at NCI, we have a, a command that you can run called NCI account. And this will give you an overview, like a current at the moment, overview of where you are with your quarter. So it'll tell you about the grant that you have, the number of uh, service units that you've used so far, if you have any current jobs, how much they're actually you're going to use, and how much you have available. Um, there's also, it'll also give you some information about the storage as well. Uh, just step forward, please. Um, so in addition to that command line account, if you go into the um, uh, user portal, you can also get an overview of your project, um, which gives you, a, might be a little bit easier to understand. And this will show you where you are with your using up your quota and how much we sort of expect you might use by the end of the quarter if you keep on going at the current rate. So this can also be a little um, thing to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So I've mentioned uh, your quota. The other thing to think about is storage. So on Gaddy and also on Zotonix, we have network file systems that are very high capacity file systems that have very high throughput. Um, and there are some oddities about them because they are because of the way they're structured. So one thing that people don't necessarily understand is that there may also be quotas on file count, file counts as well as space. And there can also be different types of storage and different policies around how you can use this storage. So one type of uh, disk that you might see is a scratch disk, and you do really use that when you're doing calculations, um, and really for as a, as a scratch space. Uh, so intermediate files will sit there, and your final results might sit final results and input files might sit there temporarily while you're doing things. But because this is a shared resource, um, you might get extra space there. But there will be a policy around deleting files that haven't been accessed regularly. Um, and what that policy is depends on where you are. So I think it, uh, on Zotonix, it might be 30 days. On uh, Gaddy here, I think it's 100 days. And it just varies from place to place. So you have to be aware of this. And then there's also usually uh, a persistent storage where you can use for storing files or software installs over a longer period of time. On, on the NCI systems, that, that longer persistent storage is called GData. So we have uh, all facilities will provide uh, commands that let you have a look at how you're using the storage. Um, one very easy to use command at, on Gadi is LQuota. And I'll just give you an overview of um, where you are, where you sit with your project. It'll tell you how much you've used, what your quota is, and it'll tell you that, break that down both by the space that's used and the number of files that you have. Uh, we also have a couple of extra uh, commands that can be very useful. Um, I won't go into detail on them here, but it's just useful to note them. Uh, so we have one which will NCI files report, which will tell you about the usage, storage usage by your project. So you might have many people in your project and you'll be able to get a detailed report of who is using what, who has the most amount of files and, and things like that. And for scratch space, uh, which is only temporary, we have a command ncvi file expiries. So you can use this to manage um, um, files that are going to be deleted. You can see which files are going to be deleted and in some cases actually bring them back. Um, so next slide, please. So um, Sarah talked about submitting a job to the queue. And when you submit a job, into onto to run on a HPC facility that goes to a scheduler. And the scheduler's job is basically to, to make the best use of, um, of the resources that are available. So it, it considers several different things. So the basic task that it is to, that it has is to take all of the queued, queued jobs and choose the next one to run. Um, um, so there are three things that you need that you typically three resources that you typically request when you do that: the number of cores, the memory, and also the wall time. And getting these right really helps both yourself. You'll get good throughput on the queue, so you're on the queue system, so your your job won't la won't um, take a, a particularly long time to be queued, and also um, uh, other users are are. Uh, uh, won't be affected by your job. Uh, and there's an analogy that you can have between the task of a scheduler with Tetris. So the, the scheduler knows what jobs are running at the moment, and it has to 
forecast into the future um, based on the jobs that it uh, knows uh, have been submitted. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have some tool um, in terms of seeing where your jobs are, are, how well your job is using the, the resources that it requests. Um, there are several different ways that um, facilities can get you that information. At NCI, we add a postscript to the standard output for every job. Um, and other sites have similar commands. So I think on um, POSI, where they use Slurm, Ceph will give you a breakdown of the resources used by a job and how that compares to the resources that you requested. So just step forward, please. So here's what the, um, uh, um, the that postscript looks like. So it'll give you some basic information about your job, when it ran, the idea of the job, the project that you charged against, how many service units were used, and the resources that you requested in terms of CPUs, which is in interchangeable at NCI with cores, the memory that you requested, the wall time that you requested, and also something that I'm not, not going to discuss here, but how much uh, on-node storage was requested. And on the right-hand column, it tells you actually how much you used. So the number of cores that were used, the compute time that was used in terms of CPU hours, uh, the memory that was used, the wall time, uh, and again, the, the job FS, because of the local node storage. And in this case, you can see on the left-hand side, wall time of six hours was requested. Um, but actually only two hours was two hour and a third hours was used. So that's there's a bit of a difference there between those two. Um, and in this case, uh, the scheduler may have actually prioritized your job over another job based on it thinking that this job was going to run for six hours. So getting the wall time uh, used and the wall time requested roughly to be the same um, really helps other, both yourself and other users. Uh, just step forward, please. And again, thanks. Um, so the other thing that you can work out from a postscript like this is something that I'll call an efficiency. And that basically is just a measure of the CT CPU time that's used against the maximum possible CPU time that is used. So if you ask for one for 10 cores, but you end up only actually using one core, uh, that's what you will show up in, in a, something like an efficiency calculation. So here I just stepped through how to calculate that CPU time. So we've got the CPU, so that, that efficiency. So we've got the CPU time used, which is 54 and basically a third hours. Uh, and that's divided through by the, the actual wall time that was used, but it's the maximum potential, uh, which is two and a third hours times 24 cores. And for this particular run, we get a very high efficiency. Um, but if you, so 0 0.98, where one would be the maximum, but if you get a lower value, you might consider, you know, reducing the resource, uh, the number of cores that you request. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that was tip two. Um, the, moving on to the next tip, which is really about how you think about optimizing your use of the, the system. Um, so between you applying for the, the uh, uh, project and actually getting the allocation, you're, the actual work that you might want to do has changed slightly, or you might find out that it was actually more expensive to run things, um, or you might want to do something slightly differently. And in that case, you may need to optimize your workflow. Um, so optimization is a very, very large topic, and I can't cover particularly um, going to much detail about um, what you do here, but I would just want to present some of the ideas and some of the processes that you might think about. Um, so one is to, to give some ideas of metrics to understand cost, that to understand that there are limits to how much you can parallelize your work. Um, a pattern that we see frequently in bioinformatics is a scatter gather pattern. And also something that I'd encourage you to do is to explore different tools if that's relevant to your project. So next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so how do you think about your project? So you have to really ask yourself what's important to you. Um, and there's three basic ways that I think about most projects that I see. One is time. So you might be time sensitive and it's important to process a sample that you submit uh, to be processed as quickly as possible. In that case, you might actually made up, make some trade-offs. So you might have to um, go for a higher cost per sample or a lower efficiency. 
Uh, the other thing that might be, say you initially planned to have 200 samples, but you ended up with 250. Uh, in that case, you might want to uh, optimize for cost. Um, so in, in this case, you may choose a slower or cheaper queue to run your jobs through, or you might actually reduce the number of cores that you um, use at a particular time. Um, and the, the, other thing, the other dimension that you might think about is really throughput. So you might be generating data um, at a particular rate, say 20 samples a month, and then you need to process that at the, at the same rate. Uh, so you think about the number of samples that you can process in a day or samples that you can process in a week or a month or whatever. So what is the relevant time scale for you? Um, really? Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the other thing is to sort of understand that there are limits to the amount, uh, to the sort of amount that you can parallelize your tasks. So typically in bioinformatics, we see multi-threaded tools, which use uh, shared memory, and they may have an option to set the number of threads. So if you've got a nice uh, big node with more than hundred cores, like we have Fosia and, uh, and um, Gaddy, why not just set the number of threads to the largest number possible? And the reason that you don't do that is that only part of the problem may actually be shared among threads. So as I've tried to show in the, the middle diagram here, uh, typically the, uh, the execution of a, a task can be broken down into a serial component, which is fixed, that might be actually reading from disk, and a parallel component, which can actually be uh, broken down and shared across cores. So even if that serial component is a, a like, small minority of the uh, total amount of computational time, it can actually really impact how, how, how much a, a task can be parallelized. So I've tried to show that here, where the, the serial component of a, job, of a task is 25% and the parallel component is 75%. So as we increase the number of cores, we don't get a real, um, real significant drop past two or three cores. Uh, uh, you don't see a significant drop in the execution time beyond two or three cores, and there's really a, um, uh, uh, some limits to how much you can, how many cores it makes sense to to scale across. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, another pattern that you can think about employing for your for your workflow is what we call a scatter gather pattern. So typically, data parallel workflows apply the same steps, as Georgie said, to, to different samples. But sometimes the data itself can be uh, split into multiple people's that are multiple pieces that are analyzed separately. Um, so that's scattering, so breaking it down and uh, working on it independently. And at the end of processing, you can bring those all together so you can gather them together uh, for the final outputs. And in this case, tools to look at to consider using are things like new parallel, We've also got a command called NCI parallel at NCI. Um, with Slurm, you can use array jobs. And if you've got a Python-based workflow, um, tools like Dask um, can be very useful in that case. Next slide, please. Um, and the final thing that I want to consider when, in terms of working smarter um, is using considering different tools. So perhaps you look at your workflow and you can identify some steps of it that are consuming a high number of uh, high number of SUs or a long, require a long amount of time. What I would encourage you to do is really identify the few steps that are taking the most time or most service units, and look to see if there are any alternative tools. So, for tasks like alignment, there are several different aligners that are all reasonably functionally equivalent. Or um, you know, so BWA and Parabricks and BWMM2 all do roughly the same thing uh, for alignment. Um, you may also have some code that's written in uh, an interpreted language like Python and a compiled alternative exists um, that would be you know, more efficient and faster to run. So consideration one, uh, when you have something like this is to look at scientific benchmarking. Um, uh, and really, you have to ask yourself uh, a couple of questions there. What, you know, if you're putting in another tool, what's important to you? Do the results need to be absolutely identical? So byte for byte identical? 
or do the results need to be equivalent in some statistical way? Um, so for rare variants, you may see the same number of rare variants with two different alignment methods. And consideration two, which is secondary, I think, to, to the scientific benchmarking is looking at performance. So getting a good idea if you swap in a different tool, how, how it changes the number of service units required and how it also changes the time. And I'll finish up there and hand back to Georgie. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so this is our final pro tip. Um, I think it follows on pretty nicely from the previous three because um, you can use workflow management tools to help you with um, all of the points that Sarah and Matthew just mentioned. So that is software management, resource management, and also resource, resource optimization. Um, so workflow management tools, if you haven't heard of them or haven't used them before, um, they are just software applications that are designed specifically to compose and execute a series of, of computational processes that, that you define. Um, so if you consider this, um, the workflow diagram here that, that I've borrowed, um, it describes baking cookies, right? Um, workflow management tools can be really handy in helping you um, manage process dependencies. So as you can see here in these two blue boxes, um, so that means ensuring that you know, tasks only are only run or, or completed when the prerequisite, their prerequisite tasks have been complete. Um, workflow management tools can also dynamically distribute computational resources across multiple tasks that are running in parallel, um, like how in the diagram here that you can um, preheat the oven whilst also prepping the other ingredients at the same time. So uh, basically the idea here is instead of having everything, um, having to, you have to, have to like run a bunch of scripts individually um, and manually one after the other, or say chuck everything inside of a big bash or a Python script um, that will inevitably fail when something you know halfway through um, breaks for whatever reason. Um, you can use workflow management tools um, to wrap these individual steps up and tie them together and handle the executions for you. And they're really like very valuable if you're um, repeatedly running the same sorts of things over and over again. Um, there are lots of different workflow management tools out there. Um, here we've just got, got some of the most popular ones um, in bioinformatics right now. Um, many of these tools share features that make them really suitable for bioinformatics um, and working on HPCs. So um, in terms of making this choice for yourself, um, you're probably going to want to consider which one suits your needs best. So whether that be compatibility with the infrastructure that you're working on, the sorts of programming languages that it can work with and that you want to work in, um, what might be easiest to learn, so what's got the lowest barrier to, to entry, um, and also what others around you, so what your colleagues and, and your community are using as well. Um, so we've been using, uh, like in, in uh, BioCommons and, and also at the Sydney Informatics Hub, we've been using um, Nextflow a lot because it's really flexible and can tie together a lot of existing pieces of code written in different languages. So I can have a workflow that has some bash, um, some Python, some R in it, and I can tie them all together really nicely and really easily. It's also got a really nice caching system, which means if your workflow run fails or, um, you know, it means you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and probably the, the biggest plus, um, I think, for us is that it's got a really great and very supportive community um, that also share a lot of their, their workflows publicly. You might have heard of the NFCore um, workflows before. That's, they're all Nextflow workflows. Um, so, uh, you know, if we reflect back on everything that, that Matthew and Sarah have just shared with us, we can really see the value of workflow management tools in handling those major pain points and, and issues when working at HPC. So, um, you know, the things that they can really do for you are um, accommodate multiple software installation methods that includes containers and modules and, and even Conda. Um, they can make our workflows portable across different infrastructures because they are able to interact with a different job scheduler. So whether if you know your HPC is set up for PBS Pro or Slurm, they can um, work with those. They're also great for reproducibility because they can explicitly handle um, you know, the sequence of tasks that you want to run as well as your inputs and outputs and they can manage all those dependencies for you. Um, so you don't kind of have to hard code them in there. Um, they also minimize data loss and ensure that um, you can your workflow your workflow's continuity by using things like checkpointing and that caching as well, which is really essential for those long running um, and troublesome jobs, especially with um, with HPCs where you might run into a wall time limit or something. 
Um, and finally, they're a great option for when you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? Because there are lots of existing public workflows out there um, that, you know, there's a big, big community of people using workflow management tools and they've written workflows um, and they've provided them publicly and you're all free to use them and you can run them on your own infrastructures with them um, with very minimal um, tweaking. Uh, so now that we've covered um, the ways you can use HPC infrastructures to your advantage, we can quickly talk about um, how and where you can access these resources. So many research organizations and universities provide you with access to various computing facilities. So this may be an institutional HPC or cloud or virtual machines. Um, your institution might also offer you, or probably also offers you um, access to national compute infrastructures. Um, like NCI and Fawzi's HPCs. Um, in terms of getting access, there are lots of ways to go about this, but it's probably best you just contact your institution's e-research or ICT support services, because they'll be able to tell you exactly what options um, are going to be available to use for your institution. Outside of that though, um, there are public merit schemes, including NCI's adapter scheme and Fawzi's partner scheme, and the NCMAS scheme that facilitates access to a number of in, uh, infrastructures as well. Um, in terms of getting support, it really depends on the type of help you're looking for. So, um, of course, your, your, all these infrastructures have help desks and support staff that you can ask specific questions about, um, you know, when you're trying to troubleshoot some issue or, or get something running on, on a particular infrastructure. But there are also um, bigger communities out there where you can discuss workflow development, um, find and share workflows, um, and also talk about specific workflow management tools like Nextflow. So we've just put a couple of um, Slack and YouTube channels up here that you guys might be interested in for general resource sharing and, and training as well. Um, and finally, I guess if you're a, a workflow developer or you'd just like to learn a bit more about what others are doing, um, I really encourage you to join the Biocommons Workflows community. Um, it's a growing community. We're pretty young though still. Um, and we talk a lot, up, um, there's a lot of different Australian workflow developers um, involved in this. Um, we have quarterly meetups and we, we talk about all kinds of things and share a lot of information with each other. It's, um, it's you know, a very useful community to be a part of. Um, and as Melissa mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, Sarah and Matthew and I are all members of the Australian Biocommons Bring Your Own Data Platform Project. Um, and these are just some of the resources that we've been creating with our partners to make accessing HPCs um, much easier for you and also make doing bioinformatics on these facilities um, a bit less broad. So in terms of what's available at NCI and Fawzi, um, we've got uh, shared bioinformatics software repositories, We've got um, infrastructure to make it easier for you to access and, and use singularity containers. Um, there's a lot of public workflows now that we've all set up for um, each of those systems and uh, also a number of workflows that are portable between systems. Um, we also have interactive environments that are tied to these facilities um, for any downstream data analyses requirements that you may have. Um, and also they've created data collections. So there are reference genomes and, and variant data sets available at these facilities for you. So you don't necessarily have to go and download them yourself. Um, these are all available to anyone who has access to these facilities. Um, and finally, if you're someone who uh, uses Nextflow already and you're interested in exploring the Nextflow Tower service for workflow deployment, um, you might wanna get involved in the Australian Biocommons um, Tower service. And um, I think Melissa will. Um, put a link to that in the chat. Um, so that's it for the webinar. Just a few things, a few takeaways for you guys to keep in mind um, as you go forward on your, your own HPC journeys. Um, so just remember that, you know, software installation on HPCs can be painful, um, but you can avoid um, some of the headache by, by using things like modules and, and singularity um, as well to run containerized pools. Um, it's really important that you understand the resource requirements of your workflow at multiple levels. So it's important you understand what the tasks, you know, the various tasks that you're running, what they need. Um, it's important you understand the size and the scale of your data set um, and also the needs, the, you know, the capabilities of the tools that you're running. So all of these things are going to be essential to you running workflow, like, uh, sorry, working efficiently and also making the most of the system. Um, please remember that HPCs are shared resources, so you shouldn't request more resources than you need and you should tidy up after yourself. Um, this isn't only a benefit to um, others, um, but also keep in mind that asking the scheduler for more resources than you actually need might actually slow you down. Um, it might not actually help you out long term. 
Um, HPC systems also provide you with a lot of useful files that you can use to um, understand uh, the efficiency um, of, your, of your processes and of your workflow as a whole. Um, so you can use things like those postscripts and the logs and stuff um, that you get at the end of a, of a job submission um, to evaluate that submission's efficiency and adjust it accordingly if you need to. Um, and finally, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. There's a lot of people out there just like you, kind of, you know, no matter what stage of your journey you're at, um, who can teach you new things, help you overcome um, any struggles you're having um, and help you develop your confidence at, at working at these facilities. Um, and yeah, plenty of people out there willing to share their own learnings with you. Um, and all of these things, yeah, are really gonna be useful in not only getting your workflows running, but also, you know, scaling them up if you need to. So I um, hope you guys have found this presentation useful um, and we've given you some food for thought. I think we have a few minutes um, left for, for Q&A. Is that right, Melissa, if um, anyone has any questions? Yes, we do. We do have time for questions. Thank you so much to Georgie, Sarah and Matthew for those pro tips. And I can see some rounds of applause appearing up on Zoom as I say that too. We do have a couple of pre-submitted questions, so we might start with those. The first one is, how do you handle needing to have some interactivity in workflows? For example, during workflow development or for especially weird samples? Uh, I think in that case, it's probably important for you to think about what parts of your workflow are suitable for uh, running it on HPC. Um, you know, maybe HPCs are better suited to uh, those more standardized um, steps that you don't really need to get a look at your data. Um, and maybe if you, if you do need to get more interactive, maybe you break down your workflow so that you, um, yeah, start off with that less interactive part. And then um, you use things like quality control steps um, and that as a bit of a break point um, and a check-in and then run uh, subsequent processes as needed. Thanks, Georgie. Sarah or Matthew, did you want to add anything onto that? Doesn't sound like it. So we'll move on to the next question, which is coming in from the audience. And it is, what do you do if you don't know how long your job will take? So, I, so I'll answer that. Um, so I think the, the best thing to do is just to test it. Um, so I, I'm assuming you're not going, when you're just testing, it's fine if you don't know exactly the long time that you need. Um, you know, if you have differently sized samples, you might be able to look at how the, the um, required wall time uh, varies with the, the actual size of the sample, and you might come up with some sophisticated way of predicting it. But really, for just a couple of test jobs, it's fine to submit a longer job than you need. Um, but when you really want to go into production and submit many jobs, try to get it you know, in, you know, fairly similar to, to how long it would actually take. So that's my answer there. So don't sweat it too much. Um, yeah, you can use the like job accounting tools like Ceph or the um, NCI Postscript to figure out like, oh, I asked for 12 hours, but I only needed three. So yeah, it really is um, an iterative process. You can't necessarily know ahead of time. So that's okay. <laughs> no one's gonna come and tell you off for that. And going to the other side of this now, if you do know you have a particularly long wall time, say more than 48 hours, how it, are there limits and how do you request more wall time? Yes, there are generally limits. Um, so in the standard work queue, it's usually something like 24 hours um, and then there can be longer queues. And this is um, in like infrastructure specific so at Pawsey there's a long queue specifically that has a wall time of four days um, at NCI I think they're look they I, well I'm not sure I don't use NCI but I'm sure there'll be um, something like that um, otherwise if you we try to get people to um, also implement checkpointing so if your code is running for like a week at a time is there a way for it to be able to stop and start or can you implement checkpointing like with Nextflow where you can stop and then restart and it'll remember what you've done um, in very special cases, you can ask for specific jobs to have an extended wall time, but that is like by special request only. Um, and we would really encourage trying to figure out why is it running for so long and can we help you improve that wall time before doing something like that. And usually you can use normally some sort of hack that you can 
do that will um, get it under a four day wall time. Yep, uh, and the NCI is the same. So if you need to run for 48 hours and there's no alternative, um, really the thing is just to go through the help system uh, and get an exception for that sort of job that you want to run. Thanks, Sarah and Matthew for that. Going down to another pre-submitted question. And this one is, how do you maintain communal workflows and shared environments on HPC? What are some best practices for that? I mean, it's a bit of a case by case basis, I suppose. Um, I think by default, a lot of things are set up for like the individual rather than for a group. Um, so you can like change the directory permissions or share things in your project um, directory as opposed to just your personal directory. Um, if you wanna share workflows, you can also think about putting them on somewhere like GitHub um, or um, trying to use containers or modules so that it's easier for your colleagues to re-implement what you're doing. Um, you can share that, set up sort of shared um, software stacks and people do do that, um, but it can also end up becoming a bit funky and things don't work quite as well as you would hope. Like I had to help someone recently and they had, um, they were referring to some environment fi file that someone had set up and actually when I stripped that out, their job worked. So I'm not sure what was in there, but it was not helping them. Um, so it, it just depends. Georgie, Matthew, did you want to add anything onto that one? Yeah, I don't think there's any magic answer that I can give you there. Uh, I mean, um, the best practices will be, you know, sort of, you know, really boring things like document what you're doing. Um, and you can you can use things so you can set up your own modules that if you like, if you like, you can. Um, you know, set up your own Python environments as well. Uh, and it's really just, you know, self-organize among yourselves. It's not a very helpful answer, but um, document what you're doing. Um, but there, there's nothing wrong with, you know, sharing your own software installs and your, yourself. I guess also worth pointing out here that both Pausing and NCI do have some um, bioinformatics specific environments already set up that you can use so you do not have to recreate it all for yourself every time that you want to use the, the national HBCs. We are coming up to time however so we are going to have to leave it there for today. I do have a couple of things to share with you before we go but first and most importantly I wanted to say a big thank you to Georgie, Sarah and Matthew for taking the time to share their hottest tips for working on HPC with us. So some other things that you might be interested in if workflows are your thing. We have a workshop shop coming up in June on using Genus to translate workflows into Nextflow. Applications close for this on the 4th of June, so that's this Sunday. So if you do want to join us for that workshop, get in soon. And then next week, we have another webinar on getting started with proteomics, where we'll be hearing from a couple of people from the Australian core facilities community, and they'll be running us through those key things you need to think about for proteomics. The information about both of these events is up on the Biocommons website, and you can keep up to date with the latest news and events by following us on Twitter or subscribing to our newsletter as well. So thank you again to our speakers today and thank you to all of you for joining us as well. We hope that you enjoyed this webinar and that we will get to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now and enjoy the rest of your day.